Warning. I'm very pleased to be joined on this edition of The Warning with Charlie Sadoff, a documentary filmmaker. His newest release is Against All Enemies. The CIA has this tool where they measure levels of insurgency or in an incipient insurgency. Do you want your house back? Take it! See a civil war. In this fight, it's far from over and it may never be over. I, Stanley McCrystal, Lisa Fon, do solemnly I swear to the, the Constitution of the United, United States, States against all, against all enemies, enemies, foreign and domestic. So help me God. Welcome, Charlie. Hi, Steve. Great to be with you today. Let's talk about the title and its meaning. Against all enemies. Against all enemies refers to the oath of office and oath of service uh, that everyone in the military takes when they enlist. And that particular line is against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And the reason that's the name of the film is because what we look at is the choice that military veterans make to join extremist groups and seemingly betraying that oath by turning against the country that they enlisted to serve. And we saw obviously evidence of that on January 6th, but it goes well beyond that. Um, it started long before January 6th. It's going to continue long after. And so that that's where the title comes from. I want to dwell deeper into the title because there's a word in there that's important. Enemy. What is an enemy? In... The case of this film and what we've discovered is that the enemy is considered the enemy within. And so this is something that was started, you, you started hearing a lot of this after the Vietnam War. And there's a character in our film um, named Louis Beam who came back from Vietnam. He's a decorated veteran. Uh, he soon rose to the head of the KKK in Texas and he was very explicit about the enemy within who he identified as primarily Jews who had taken over the government, but anyone, basically anyone who wasn't white or didn't affirm the idea that white men in particular should be running the country. And so he identified the enemy as people in the United States who were acting against this and set out to overthrow the government and anyone who stood in the way of that. And so that's persisted till today. And now you look at some of the statements coming from President Trump, he's sort of using some of that same language about the enemy within. If you look at, for example, his Memorial Day, true social posts, just aimed at veterans, you know, um, he's identifying what essentially is what he's referring to as the enemy within. Three, two, one, one go. go. Right behind you, right behind you. One of our guys up there is SF, Special Forces Vet. And we have another one that's a retired staff sergeant, SF. I'm not surprised that extremist organizations try to recruit veterans for the credibility that we bring, but also for our commitment. Um, and that commitment takes a lot of forms. Veterans are people in our society who in many ways have said, I will do whatever is necessary to preserve what I believe in, up to and including violence. Uh, put a scope on it and take big hands if you get That's the same kind of shit that they've been doing their whole career. You know, now they're doing it here inside the United States. It's kind of a weird feeling. The thing that most surprised me or that I learned was that what Ali Soufan describes in the film as sort of a salad bar of grievance narratives. When I realized that things that seemingly don't, why would, why would COVID and immigration and anti-wokeness and um, the second amendment, what, why would all these things be connected? And the thing that was really fascinating is that, and this goes back you know, to the KKK, the original salad bar was what the KKK had was, you know, anti, was uh, blatant racism. And then they evolved and they used whatever tools they could to recruit based on whatever the issue was in the area that they were trying to recruit. And now with these groups today, 
on social media. They're able to recruit so much more and they have a huge, as he said, salad bar of grievance narratives you can, you can dip into. So if you're upset about the vaccine or you're upset about immigrants or you're upset about someone potentially taking your guns away. And of course the big lie is the biggest one going on right now. If you think that your government was unduly elected and that there's a crime family now in the White House, is which we heard a lot of. These things are all used to recruit people, and particularly veterans, into these movements. And you might not be someone who's necessarily a racist, or you might not be someone who's anti-Semitic, but these groups, the thing that unifies them all is white power. Ultimately, that's the goal, white power. And so if you can get someone into the movement through whatever this grievance narrative that is most effective at that particular time, then you have an opportunity to build your movement. And particularly with veterans, veterans make these, these movements much more dangerous and much more appealing because veterans have a lot of clout in this country. So if you're in the Oath Keepers or you're the Proud Boys or the Three Percenters and you're able to recruit veterans, you're not only making yourselves much more potent as a potential violent force, but you're also giving yourself a lot of credibility because people in this country really admire veterans and for good reason. But um, when they're recruited into these, these movements, they are then serving a different purpose than what they signed up for and the oath they originally took. And that makes it dangerous. So I would say this idea that all these things are sort of interconnected in a way that allows for greater recruitment into them is something that I found very fascinating. When you talk about the Ku Klux Klan, I, you raise a really interesting point. And so are you talking about the iterations of the Klan as they've existed over the history of it? We look at this in the film, the KKK was started as a quote unquote veteran social organization. Yeah. Uh, Nathan Bedard Forrest, started the KKK when he came out of the Civil War. And it quickly transformed itself from a veteran social organization, which is what the Proud Boys call themselves, a veteran socialist organization. When he helped start the KKK as a veteran social organization, it quickly transformed into a group intent on terrorizing Blacks in the South. And I think most importantly, um, keeping Blacks from voting. That was a chief goal of the KKK. And they did that obviously through through intimidation and this idea of, of the lost cause. And they were very effective at it. And for, and not just, and at a certain point they got, the reason they were so effective is because they were able to get an alignment with the Democratic Party at the time. And they were able to rewrite the laws of who was able to vote. And I know you know all this in the South, but effectively kept blacks from the polls in the South for a hundred years, which is an incredible achievement. And as you said, the KKK has then transformed itself and been very malleable and able to pivot away from just this idea of going after um, this idea of only being racist to being anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant, anti-Jewish, whatever the cause may be. And I think that what I hope people understand now is that there's a direct link from the KKK to all the way up to Timothy McVeigh. In between that was Lewis Beam with Timothy McVeigh and now the language that you hear, for example, from the folks in Michigan who were trying to who were trying to kidnap and hang Gretchen Whitmer, using the same language that has been used by the KKK and the likes of Lewis Beam and Timothy McVeigh, this continues to today. There's a through line. There's a through line, and so I think that's what I would like people to understand because I think most people would say, "Oh, you know, if they understood that what." And the people who are even in these groups, if they understood fully that what they're really doing is no different than what the KKK was doing, they might think twice about joining these groups or espousing uh, their stated purpose. 
And I, th I hope that people who watch the film can come away with that sort of understanding of what's, what's really going on here. I, I want to talk about veterans who find their way into these movements. And I want to spend a minute talking about veterans and do so with some awareness of an archetype, a stereotype in particular that emerged after the Vietnam War when we were we were kids to the generation above us. And it, it played out in a couple of ways. You had the archetype of the twisted, sick, demented veteran, mentally ill, uh, Robert De Niro in Taxi Driver. Right, a, a perfect example. Uh, you know, Christopher Walken's character in the end of the Deer Hunter. Uh, completely lost. So, so veteran as as victim, uh, veteran as broken, psychotic. Most veterans do not find their way to either the psych ward or to the militia, right? Most, most veterans serve and they come away from that service and go on to do whatever they do in civilian life with a lot of success. As is the case after all wars and particularly one that lasts 20 years, there will be a high moral cost, traumatic injury emotionally, um, destruction of the human soul, all of these things that that the nation that the nation has an obligation to do. So when we're talking about military veterans who find their way to these groups, is there a common link? Were they disciplined in the military? Were they aggrieved in the military? Are they searching for a community outside of the military? Who are these veterans? What is this cohort of veteran that we're talking about? I think, Steve, I, you actually identified it's not it's not it's all of the above or what you just what you just said so i think a lot a lot of them are when they come out of the military are searching for that camaraderie and that purpose that they had and then when they're out of the military they don't have it anymore and then as you know chris goldsmith is in our film says when a guy like Stuart rhodes comes along and he's someone who He's wearing, I mean, one thing I'll say, he's wearing the eye patch, so he looks like he's a combat wounded veteran. He actually shot himself in the eye on a shooting range here in the States. Um, but- Make it up. Yeah, right? Um, when he comes around, he says, look, they're, they're coming after your guns. The government doesn't doesn't honor you. They don't respect you. They sent you off to a war that you didn't really want to be. That you know we had no business fighting. And here, this is our that we have a family for you now, and we're gonna like we're gonna give you purpose, and we're gonna give you a mission. And the mission he, for example, he gave before he went to jail was to try and overthrow the U.S. government. And that's why he was convicted of seditious conspiracy. Um, so a lot of people are looking for that. That camaraderie and that 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 sense of, of belonging again. I think probably a number of them, as you said, um, some obviously have are suffering from PTSD. Some may have been disciplined in the in the military while they were there. I think you know you get a cross section. Uh, I think the other thing is what we notice with what we and what we found out with the younger generation who are being recruited into things like uh, groups like the Patriot Front, is these are a younger generation, Gen Z soldiers who signed, they, they signed up for the military and never got a chance to fight. And now this is their chance to fight. So they're being told, 
you know, they wanted, they were looking for action in the military. They never got it. And now, okay, here's your chance. Here's your chance to take, uh, take your skills that you never got to use overseas, but you can use them here at home. And so that's, that's a dangerous proposition, especially with these younger kids who are, who never got the chance to fight and want to fight. And for the, and also for the same thing applies to uh, veterans who were overseas. Like we, we, we see evidence of guys who are in special forces who definitely fought overseas. And when they come back, it's as Denver Riggleman says, you get a chance to fight again. And that's something that's very appealing for some of them. And now again, it's a small percentage and we're not, we're, there's no intention to indict all veterans, but a small percentage of veterans, especially ones who are in the special forces can make a huge difference. They're what we call force multipliers. So um, that's, that's sort of what the film gets into is this idea that even a small number of veterans can have an outsized impact. Our group was the second group to enter Afghanistan. Oh, yep. yeah, man. It's so enticing. You get to fight again, you know? You're trained in certain things. You know, you can see the battlefield better. If you believe the country's under attack, you have a certain set of skills that maybe you were trained, uh, trained with that you can, you know, help the group around you, right? You're a force multiplier. They're fucking coming. Ready to go. Hey guys, everybody spread out, get eyes open, get a good perimeter. They light shit on fire, we can shoot on them, right? Yep. They're very fucking well. Hopefully they light shit on fire. Do you see a moment of armed conflict coming where there is a separatist group? that has control of a road or entrance into geographic territory. So I'm thinking, uh, for example, in the state of Idaho, uh, back to the Canadian border, uh, you know, uh, road system, heavily, heavily wooded, couple hundred, couple hundred guys up there who declare this is now the Republic of Trumpistan. We control it, right? It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the white Republic of whatever. Do, do you see that happening? Do, do you see, do you see action happening in a, in a coordinated, sophisticated fashion as a movement in a in a in a unity of action involving say more than a hundred people simultaneously anywhere in the country over the next couple of years again after January sixth and or with weapons do do you see a possibility of that one thing you hear a lot about the groups like the Proud Boys the Oath Keepers the Three Percenters is a lot of people says oh. These people are knuckleheads, you know, they're not really or they're, they're not really that much of a threat. What do we have to worry about them for? They're out there doing like their their little training sessions, you know, out in the woods. What, what are they really going to do? And Ali Sufan, I said, Ali Sufan said, yeah, we said the same thing about the Taliban before 9-11. Oh, they're just a bunch of people in caves who don't know what they're doing. And he says the threat of these groups is the greatest threat to the United States today, these violent extremist groups. So can I say exactly who it's gonna be? No, but it's gonna be some group like some militia, like the Three Percenters, like the Oath Keepers, um, like the Patriot Front. And I think Idaho is a great example, see, because a lot of the activity of these groups has been in Idaho for, since the 70s. That's where they all sort of gathered in Hayden Lake to have their conference of hate. Um, and that, after that, there was, a, there was a group who met in the 80s and Louis Bean was part of that. And after that, there were a number of cell style terrorist attacks that took place in the United States um, over the course of four or five years. And it wasn't committed by a hundred or so folks, but it was, you know, a number of groups and Lewis Beam and that group was actually put on trial and they were acquitted for trying to overthrow the government. But I see no reason why the same thing is not going to happen. Um, 
I don't think it happened before the election, but I think if the, the election is going to be a, a marker because either look, there's two outcomes, right? Biden's going to win or Trump's going to win. And if Biden wins, can you imagine Trump and his supporters taking that and saying, accepting the results of that election? And I think the fact that Trump has been calling the, the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th and have since been tried and convicted and in prison, they're now, he's now referring to them as political prisoners, patriots. That's, there's a reason for that. It's not just, I think, that um, he's trying to, you know, kowtow to his base. I think perhaps he's giving a signal that if this thing happens again, you all, the people who are there are, are martyrs. Don't look at them as, as criminals. And so he's, there's an opening there for people to take action. And I think I would not at all be surprised if we do, in fact, see um, the kind of things you're talking about. Those, I don't, it's not, there's not going to be a standing army. It's not going to be a civil war like we had in the, in the 1800s, but there will be pockets of resistance and I think violence. And that's, that's what we're scared of. And that's what we try and explore in the film is the idea that the election and our political differences, which you've articulated before, which we're usually about difference in the tax rates. Now our, on our, our differences have gotten so big that the only way to solve them is through violence, potentially. And that's that's what's scary. I'm curious listening to you if the name Robert E. Lee ever comes up when you talk about any of this with any of these groups, any of the people that become involved in it. How central is he mythologically at the core of this so general lee's name doesn't come up but there's another general whose name uh general whose name comes up a lot and that's general michael flynn the thing that's really interesting to me about flynn is that when he was part of the obama administration he was promoted to the head of uh i believe it was uh defense intelligence and leon panetta in his ceremony in the in the promotion ceremony says no one has a greater understanding of the 21st century battlefield than michael flynn and obviously the 21st century battlefield is online and so now michael flynn is engaged in what recruiting what he calls an army of digital soldiers and you know it can be argued what he wants those digital soldiers to do. He's obviously, he's you know, what he's doing right now is encouraging people to run for office. I'm going to stop you right okay. there for a second because I don't think that's correct, right? I think it's perfectly clear, and I think you know it's perfectly clear, right? I think you address that with a figure of speech, right? But it's But it's perfectly clear what what he wants to have happen and in fact there's another documentary uh that appeared on frontline and the associated press which i have no doubt that you've seen where michelle smith who is the superb ap reporter who who leads the story at the end of this documentary she goes for a walk in the woods. And it is a park-like area. And then you hear the sound of automatic weapons fire. Families on one side of the giant fence with razor wire on top of it and Michael Flynn's compound on the other side where they're training for what? They're training for civil war. According to who? According to you? According to me? According to General Flynn. That's what they're, that is what they are doing. Um, and so I, I just think it's important at, for the audience, for the audience to understand the 
perfect clarity of the motive of the intentionality of what it is these folks are doing nine years in to an unfolding event that that is closer and closer and closer and closer to doing real damage to the to the to the core foundation the keystone the cornerstone of the country yeah i mean so in the film we definitely we have chris goldsmith he speaks very eloquently about michael flynn and what his objectives are which is to <clears throat> create a country where people are decided people the country is separated by your in and out group and it's all about power for him obviously and so yeah i won't i won't disagree with what you're saying about what flynn's intentions are and he but back to what i was saying before his knowledge i, I don't think he should be taken lightly um because as panetta said he understands how to foment and create insurgencies because he spent his entire career trying to figure out how to combat them and so that's what makes him particularly dangerous because if his intent is to foment an insurgency or an insurrection against the government of the united states there's probably no one more uh capable of figuring out how to do that do you have any sense if anybody in the united states army in the in the institution of the United States Army, the retired four star officer corps. Do any of them look at Flynn and say, "We have a problem here that exceeds a corrupt general." an abusive general, a criminal general. Well, we spoke to Stan McChrystal in the film and he and Flynn have been friends and colleagues for years. And <clears throat> I think that Stan, uh, General McChrystal, he views, uh, he views um, Flynn now as sort of a political figure. And I think he thinks what he's doing is dangerous, but I don't know that there's been any sort of collective action or, or anyone's gotten together behind the scenes to figure out what they can do about it. Um, not that I'm aware of. And, you know, Flynn, it's one thing that's interesting, you know, Flynn spoken out was, you know, claimed that coronavirus was created by the government um, to help con to, you know, get control of the people on um, this whole sort of re regurgitating the same idea about um, installing chips into people as a means of getting control of them, which is something, you, you know, was this conspiracy theory going back to the eighties with Nelson Rockefeller. And he's spoken out against uh, the U S government and he's, you know, he's a convicted felon, but I believe he's still getting his army pension. So it's it's not even, you know, there's they haven't even taken any kind of action against him whatsoever. So I don't know, I don't think there's been any sort of talk about what can be done about him amongst other other groups of retired generals. At least I haven't seen it. When when people watch this, watch this film and they and they get to the end of it. The impression you will have wanted to leave them with is that the threat of political violence is real. I think people dismiss that at their own peril, that veterans play an outsized role in making that violence more potent and likely, and that if there's an opportunity to get people, get veterans that you know, or that veterans who watch the film onto an off ramp where they're not in, where they're not in these misinformation bubbles that are convincing them that the election was stolen, that coronavirus was um, manipulated to get control of the country, that 
immigrants are, you know, that there's a great replacement theory, whatever we can do to try and get veterans into a, onto a different path should be taken. And I think Ken Harbaugh, who's a co-producer with me, who you know, um, often talks about how the best way to do that is to have actual conversations with veterans that you know. Don't rely on the system to do it. Um, if the system was better, if the transition is, uh, the transition out of the military was perhaps a little bit something that was um, a better uh, thought out and organized process for a lot of these veterans, we might not be having as many of these problems, but that's a bigger issue. So the best way now for to try and get veterans out of this bubble and to get them away from groups like the Oath Keepers is to just talk to them as best you can and tell them what's happening. Do you have a sense to which the way that we left Afghanistan has become a fuel for extremists who prey on a sense of moral injury? You know, we don't dig into that into the film per se, but I think it's an example and a good one of this sense of betrayal that can be manipulated and the idea that we've left people behind, the government has not lived up to its obligations to the soldiers and all the other military branches that served in Afghanistan, the idea that we would walk away um, fuels that sense of betrayal and that lack of trust in the government and the idea that the government isn't supporting veterans, isn't supporting the cause, I think that can be manipulated in the way, the same way that it was after the Vietnam War. When you look at this moment, you you seem to be at a place that I find myself at, which is, and I can just tell through the through the Zoom camera uh, on the other side of the screen, you anticipate political violence and at some scale and at some prolonged intensity and you think it's coming soon and you think it can't be stopped or am i misinterpreting that so ironically i think the one thing that could stop it is if trump wins the election um because then his call you know his when he spoke to Tucker Carlson it, for a long time I feel like this idea of civil war or insurgency or political violence was something that the left was accused of being hyperbolic about but you've seen a transition now where both sides are talking about it and when Trump went on Tucker Carlson's show on X they openly talked to Trump talked about how angry everyone is and how it's going to be, you know, how the, there's, he believes, you know, who knows what he believes. He, he said that the idea of a civil war is, is possible. And so, and I don't think he's doing anything to discourage that. So I think two things could happen. If, if, if Biden wins and the Republican Party in general, not just Trump, but if somehow the other leaders of the Republican Party came out and said, the election is valid, we don't want to contest it. Let's just move on. Maybe that would help. But do you see that happening? I don't see that happening. And if, um, but if Trump wins, then there won't, I, you know, there's, there's sort of these kinetic events that you describe in Idaho and other places are less likely in my opinion. So, the great national extortion. And this is the key in part to the assumption of power always by every autocratic movement through an election process that chaos or me. There you go. Um, you know, I think, I know you're going to Poland um, soon. And the film, our film played at a, in Poland at a film festival there. And, you know, it won the audience award because it happened, it happened to screen right after they had their election. 
And I guess this is the one thing that gives me a little hope is that in that country where the ruling party had control of the media, control of all methods of, you know, all levers of government and all institutions, somehow the left-leaning party won that election. It, it was a huge upset. And I think the people in Poland were very uh, taken by our film because at the time they were very concerned about what was happening in their country. The, the results of the election were contested. Uh, the, the ruling party was saying, oh, that the election was fake. It was, you know, we, we contest, they, you know, they said it wasn't valid. And they were very concerned that the results of the election might not hold. Eventually it did, which was great news for Poland and Europe. Um, so there are, you know, sort of these little silvers of hope that, you know, uh, little D democracy can win out, but we'll see. Well, what a perfect place to leave it. This is an important film for people to watch, to see. This is an important subject, and it's here. And so I can't wait for more people to see this because it is essential for Americans to understand the hour we have arrived at. Thank you very, very much for your time today. Thank you, Steve. It's a great, great privilege to be with you. Thank you for listening to my political commentary. If you like what you heard today, please also consider subscribing to The Warning, daily newsletter on Substack.